Our guest in this first segment is Kimberly Lowe. She's a candidate for U.S. Senate in the state of Virginia. Good morning, Kimberly. How are you? Good morning. This is such an incredible opportunity to talk about issues that are affecting Virginia and West Virginia. My name is Kimberly Lowe. I'm running for United States Senate in Virginia. I know that you air around Winchester and also Washington, D.C., but I have been working on issues that are happening in West Virginia for quite a long time and working with your legislators. And this is going to be such an important time for your listeners to hear about some of the things I've been working on. And it's, it's really going to touch the heart of a lot of West Virginians. So I kind of want to take this in the direction and the amount of time that we have to talk about those things and some of the things that have directly happened there. Um, so we have a lot of policy that's hurting our American families. Well, Kimberly, Did you know, can, yeah. if I can interrupt you for just a second, before we get yeah. into policy <laughs> stuff, could you, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and how you came about this decision to run for U.S. Senate? Thank you. So I'm actually from Southwest Virginia, and Southwest Virginia has a lot of issues very similar to West Virginia. Um, my family settled Virginia in the 1600s. I'm the only candidate born and raised in Virginia that's running. I'm the only candidate that's done anything for my state or for your state. And the the reality is we have a lot of problems. Unless we take control of these problems, we're going to be even deeper. I'm a single mom. My kids are 14, 16, and 18. They can't just go out at 18 and get an apartment. It's not easy to get a job. No one's making an income high enough to be able to afford any type of cost of living. Even our school teachers all over the place are having to work at the grocery store at night to make ends meet. And that is not a quality of life. We are slaves to a system, and it is very fixable with common sense policies. So I'm actionable. I'm a problem solver. I've always worked at ground zero to get stuff done. People have come to me from all across the state of Virginia and West Virginia to help them solve their problems. And I'm very effective. And I have a primary coming up. There's a lot of people running for this seat, but I'm the only one that's ever gotten anything done. And, and one of the biggest reasons I'm running is to restore our families. And that's what I've worked the hardest on in West Virginia that I wanted to talk to you guys about. Okay, very good. And you are you around uh, Roanoke this morning? I'm actually in Franklin County. Franklin so County. So I'm uh, a little bit south of there. Yeah, we like to call it, by God, Franklin County, the <laughs> yeah. moonshine capital. Yes. I have uh, I have an old still and an old getaway truck in my backyard that they had to abandon because they used to trick them out in the 20s. Uh-huh. <laughs> so they'd go a little quicker. Yeah, and the, I think they got in trouble in their moonshine runs. They still have the original shotgun with it, too? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, have okay. you have you run for office before, Kimberly? Yeah, and it is not an honest business. I've only been on a ballot once. Um, we had a special election, and we only had two weeks. And um, it's it's a blood sport. It's it's a super, super dishonest industry. You know, it's, it's the industry where everybody takes your money. They don't do their job. Um, it's not easy, but I really feel confident that I can win this seat against Tim Kaine because I'm going to communities where where conservatives have never gone before and where a lot of people don't go. I think we're the campaign for everybody and for we, we just want, we want to unite people, bring people together, and that's how we solve problems. We don't want to be the divisive campaign. So we're running a slightly different campaign in that sense, and mm-hmm. I feel really good about winning the state of Virginia. I do think that my primary is going to be really, really tough because the voters are confused because there's so many people running, and there's a lot of primary opponents who are not being honest to the people, and people just don't understand any of it. Why should the voters fire the incumbent Tim Kaine and hire Kimberly Lowe? There you go. Yes, yes. So what I'd really like to talk to you guys about is that West Virginia is the number one state for child removals. And I'm talking across all of America, West Virginia is removing children from their homes at the highest rate. In America, on average, we lose one child per minute to the government through our court system, through CPS. The majority of these instances are false allegations, but it has become completely monetized. There's one policy at the federal level. It's called the Adoption and Safe Family Act. And I'm not saying 
end adoption. I'm not saying that all kids don't need to be moved into a different situation. What I am saying is probably in 98% of the cases, children are being taken from their families. We're paying for that trauma for families. These families are fighting like crazy to get their kids back, and they can't fight the system because a lot of them are poorer, and they and they don't understand that they have any rights. Um, we actually spend $29 billion at the federal level. That money funnels down into states. States like West Virginia get the money. This money is barely trackable because a lot of it doesn't have to be reported, so we're not even clear how much is really funneling to the to states, how it's exactly being used. And then from there, um, there's a lot of uh, abuse hotlines where people can call, but what happens is that becomes weaponized. It's a neighbor calling against a neighbor. It's a divorce situation, and someone is calling. But the problem is when someone shows up at your door and you don't know your rights, once they take your child, it's really almost impossible to get them back. And that's something I've been working on for about a decade, particularly in West Virginia, because your legislators understand that you have a problem. They don't know how to fix it. The only way to fix it is to cut the head off of that, the money that's coming into the state. So what I do propose is that we take that money and we reallocate it to help our families to work on generational poverty, housing instability, opioid addiction treatment, and mental health care access. If you look at the big picture, this is actually costing us trillions of dollars. And one of the best things we could do is we could start stabilizing our families because once you have trauma, that trauma leads to uh, low graduation rates. A lot of these kids don't have family once they get out. A lot of these kids end up uh, going towards drugs, being incarcerated, higher crime rates. So so there's a lot to say for society in fixing this. And let me tell you real quick how I got involved with this. I got a phone call out of Preston County, West Virginia, years back, and it was a mom. She had homeschooled her kids. West Virginia does not like homeschoolers. Uh, It's not a homeschool-friendly state. We have stuff set up for homeschoolers, but it doesn't mean that you have rights still. They They seem to come after people who want to school their children at home. And it's really horrible. This mom who's married with six kids, uh, one of the local deputies was sending inappropriate pictures of himself. So he wasn't stopping. She eventually went and made a complaint. Next thing she knows, a guardian ad litem, who was the girlfriend of the deputy, shows up at their home with all these police, kicks their door down, and remove six children at gunpoint. And she never, ever saw her kids again. And instead, they put the mom in jail. They put a really high bond on her. We don't even know where this money went. Uh, It was a bond of $120,000. The grandmother had to sell their home just to get her out of jail. And they have just tortured this family for years. But that's not the only story. This is how I got pulled into West Virginia. So... Uh, One Thanksgiving, I said, I'm going to go into West Virginia, and I'm going to help this family out. And then I started to host rallies in different places across West Virginia to bring awareness. And uh, I actually have an entire system. It's, it's, I have a kind of a private group that's called uh, West Virginia with Kimberly Lowe, and we basically have an entire national funneling system where we help families in West Virginia. I've got a friend in Alaska who helps vet them to try to get them the help that they need because a lot of these families can't afford, uh, you know, any type of attorney help. The whole system is pinned against them. It's horrifying. We actually pulled in a human rights watch group from California. California came in, took all the data because the numbers were so horrifying in West Virginia. The problem with data is that people can do data all day long, but then they never do anything with the data. So, West Virginia has a serious problem. Southwest Virginia has very, very similar numbers. And I I just think, I think we should make our families as strong as possible. I will say in some of these counties, we were able to replace the CPS heads. Um, There's a judge that is heavily, heavily, heavily removing children in one county. And we have not been able to touch this judge and their actions. And you know, I think we should strengthen families, and this is something that I can fix. 
Kimberly, I'm going to ask uh, Bill Stubblefield if he has a question for you. Bill? Uh, good morning, uh, Kimberly. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you sound like an individual with great passion, but I'm a little confused on just where you're going. Uh, yeah. uh, you're, you're running for, U, uh, for U.S. Senate from Virginia. You spend right. most of the time talking about West Virginia. Yeah, uh, you guys and, are in West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I realize that. Uh, but it's uh, but who in West Virginia have you have who have you been working with? You mentioned working with some other politicians. Who exactly? Yeah, yeah uh, for years I've just worked with whoever has been in head of your legislature. So, I mean, this has been going on for a long time. You know, people start to retire out. I know Seibold over in Preston County has since retired, and uh, Amy Summers, I believe, is not in the similar position. So your, your legislators care about what's happening, but the reality is it's not fixable unless we reallocate the funding at the federal level and all they've done is layer policy on top of policy and they tried to make it that funds would go to the appropriate place but it, it's just not working and so i just i just really really think we should keep our families together i know the opioid addiction problem is huge in both virginia and west virginia i'm actually sixth generation roanoke uh, a lot of the opioid epidemic problem uh, really spurs from Roanoke. I mean, just recently, I think it was this week, the governor's wife here in Virginia said, you know, make Roanoke an example. If we can solve the issue here in Roanoke, then maybe we can solve it for other places. And the drug issues are contributing to the loss of children from their homes. And, and there's a couple ways that we can tackle this. And I know you had questions, but did you have more questions than that? Because I can talk all day. <laughs> well, yeah. Let me drift away from. <laughs> yeah. Let me drift away from policy yeah. very quickly. Uh, okay. The you have a primary coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the uh, uh, some your Facebook page, looking at other, I see that compared to your other primary candidates, you're very underfunded. Uh, when will your primary be, and uh, uh, and who do you and how do you? think you'll fare being an unfunded race, underfunded well, race? first of all, nobody has any idea how much money we've spent over this quarter. Nobody has any idea how much money we're going to have coming out of this quarter. And there's a reason for that. Everybody else is going to knock each other out before we come out with flying colors after this quarter. <laughs> and unlike other candidates, I spent my time helping on our state races last year, which is where our resources and funding should have gone. We actually have one primary candidate who lied to all the voters and to the donors and raised $724,000 supposedly for state candidates and pocketed all that money for himself when we lost a lot of our state seats. It's our state seats where you end up having parental rights. If life is your issue, that's determined at the state now. And they're trying to take our guns away in Virginia. You know why? Because we have a Democrat-controlled General Assembly. In Virginia, you don't have the right to know if your child has been trafficked or raped in school because we have a Democrat-controlled Assembly. So I'm disgusted by some of the politics. Nobody has any idea what we're going to look like coming out of this quarter. And I can tell you right now we're going to be perfectly fine and again, if you've never done anything for my state of Virginia, they need to go home and they're never going to win against Tim Kaine. They've got no experience with anything, no experience with politics. Um, they just need to get out of get out of my way because I can solve problems and help a lot of people. What was your other question? No, I think you answered. You, I think you answered my question. I did. So, okay, good. Uh, Maria. Yeah. Um, so, Kimberly, this is Maria Lawrenson. So, I'm looking also at your social media. It looks like you have 3,300 followers. Um, this is to sort of segue um, what Bill was saying. So, how do you? Um, how do you get your message out? With in terms of funding, you say there's this. You know, okay. plethora of if I, may, if, if I may interrupt you, there's someone in the race that's raised over a million dollars and they barely have any followers on Facebook. I've been heavily shadow banned on Facebook. I am on the ground with the people. I have been doing political work in Virginia for over a decade. So I have name recognition. People know who I am. These other people sleep in Northern Virginia, have never done a daggone thing in this state. They've never done anything for West Virginia either. So you cannot judge based on that. Further, 
there was a poll on Twitter um, about the Senate candidates and about the first debate. The person who had over 45 or 50,000 followers on X got 4% of the vote, and I got I came in second. And, you know, and I, I don't have many followers on X or Twitter because I'm more of an on-the-ground person. You know what I learned? I learned that Virginians are not on those social media things, like the primary voters. They don't have accounts on that. I mean, we basically did a poll of everybody in my phone, all of my donors, and people just are not on those those social media things. And I think that that was a great, great time to learn that. So, so I mean, you really can't look at those numbers. So you're getting your message out then, boots on the ground, not spending Correct. a ton of money advertising, um, but just trying to meet with people. Virginia's a big state. Um, I'm actually spending a lot of money. I've spent a lot of money this quarter. And everyone will see that when my FEC report comes out. And it's really sad that I mean, I, I don't know what your perspective is, but I mean, I am boots on the ground and I'm with the people and I understand the issues here in Virginia and I have solutions to problems. Kimberly, let's talk about some national issues. As a senator, you'll be tasked with uh, voting on. And one of those, of course, that's uh, primary in Republican politics is the border. Tell me, right, yeah. tell me if you've I'm, been there at all and uh, otherwise your thoughts on how it's being handled. I'm the only candidate that is in the race right now currently that has spent an extensive amount of time at the border. Um, the only way to fix this is through policy. Um, Trump did have a wall. Biden sold it for like $150,000 after putting all this money into it. I will tell you that the wall only slows down people crossing. The thing that's really effective is policy. And what Democrats need to realize is that this is not a humane way to enter the country. I have been in holding facilities in Eagles Pass where other people have never been because I made friends with people in the local government who are Democrats. Um, but I've been able to go into all sorts of places where people, other people haven't been. Um, about 300 to 500 people easily pass through Eagles Pass per day. A lot of these nonprofit places are run by the cartel very young people with very nice vehicles. It's really sad for some of the workers. There was a worker from Venezuela that was working there who was crying and crying because he had become attached to this girl who he knew was just going to be trafficked. And so people go through the Dorian Gap. They get to the southern border of Mexico. The United Nations is giving them money. We've got to cut off the U.N., then Mexico was also transporting them all the way up to us. The way to control the migration of people is to control Mexico through any type of trade uh, to stop them. The cartels are something that are always morphing, always changing. They change a little bit how people end up crossing. I have met a mother whose son drowned crossing the Rio Grande. And so that's why I tell Democrats this is not a humane way for people to cross, to have to owe the cartel money. If they don't pay the money, they end up killing their family members on the Mexican side. And, you know, we can build a wall. It's, it's just going to slow them down. Um, right now, our Border Patrol agents are really busy just doing paperwork. I've sat there and watched Border Patrol where all night long they try to catch small groups. So many people are crossing over. It's an extreme national security issue. Just in December, about 40,000 Chinese militants crossed. I can tell you here in southwest Virginia, there are illegal immigrants outside of our schools taking surveillance of our schools. So it is a serious problem. It's a policy fix. Mexico needs to keep them on that side. We've seen in the past that these border border policies work. Kimberly, just ahead is a Social Security and Medicare cliff. This country cannot afford to pay its obligations if you look forward uh, <clears throat> if even fewer than 10 years uh, down the road now for the fiscal soundness of these two major entitlement programs. Your thoughts, if you are a U.S. Senator, on how to fix and address this issue? Yeah, we have to stop lying to the American people. Our economy is going to crash and reset we are, I don't, didn't look at today's number. The, the other day it was $34.4 trillion in debt. That doesn't include all the personal debt. This is all a complete scam. The Federal Reserve is a privately owned entity. It's not a government entity. We are in the middle of de-dollarization. 
Bricks actually just did something on the 11th, which is going to continue to affect the dollar. Bricks are all of the countries that came together. They're going to be asset and gold backed. Um, that is going to change the sanctioning power of America. So what I'm saying is we cannot think in the same terms that we are at. We have had currency resets in the past. We're about to have one. Um, I'm telling you, I think it's probably going to happen this year. I think that we're going to change our currency to a U.S. note. That's going to be commodity and asset backed. I think that it's going to change our prices to an earlier level of prices and solve a lot of our financial problems. And you can look at some of the things that were already enacted, which is the National Economic Security and Recovery Act. Um, We just need to implement that. So I want to give people hope. But you can't think in this old paradigm of Social Security. I think things are going to change for the benefit. I think we could potentially have a debt jubilee. Debt jubilees have occurred through history. And I think we have really, really good days coming. But I think things are going to look really ugly at first. I think I think we're about to have a financial collapse, uh, mortgage um, bank collapse, and probably the stock market as well. But that's going to give us the ability to move on to shinier days because currently we're debt slaves and we're not going to continue on this path. And anyone that tells you that is lying to you to make you feel better. Kimberly, we're just about out of time. Bill, if you had a quick question, yeah. go ahead. Election, uh, election integrity. Do we have a problem in the country and what we, should we do about it? We do. We have selections, not elections. I've seen this over and over again. This is on both party sides and we currently haven't done anything to fix our election. So what's it going to look like in our presidential election? I don't know. What's it going to look like in the Senate election? I don't know. But I'm not going to stop fighting for this country. I'm not going to stop fighting for the people in Virginia and also in West Virginia um, because I have a lot of solutions. So we don't go home. We, we fight because, in my opinion, this is the end of the republic. And everyone's looking to America. So this is Amer- America is the last stand. Let's not let her fall. Kimberly, how do people find out more about your campaign for the U.S. Senate in Virginia? Thank you. You can find out more about me at www.kimberlylow.com. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Kimberly.